for the, you know, the Tiger Woods or whoever it is to tee it up and then see where it goes. And then, oh, that was amazing. That was amazing, Pastor. Just kidding. We don't do that here. We're all a family. We come together. We work together. We respond together. We draw things out together. We do life together. Life's not meant to be done alone, is it? Amen. And I am so excited about today, not just because it's Resurrection Sunday, because really every day is Resurrection Day, right? I mean, these songs, they crushed it, did they not? They crushed it. I'm like trying not to be proud or boastful because, you know, the Bible says not to be that way, but I'm like so proud of this team. I mean, like, it's amazing. And we don't do multi-tracks. That was all the fullness of God right there. That's anointing. That's not just talent. That's anointing. And God's got an anointing for you today. I was reading in the Word earlier this week, and it said in, I think it was, a, it, yeah, Ezekiel 46, uh, there's a law of worship according to the Old Covenant. And, and, and one of the things that the New Covenant does is it, 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 it fulfills the Old. But one of the things that they did when they came into the house of God, it says it's very, very clear. God's very specific. He's very organized. And he says, hey, when you come in to the north gate to worship the Lord, you must leave the south gate. And just to be clear for all the, the people that weren't the sharpest ones, he goes, if you come in from the east gate, you need to leave out of the west gate just to cover it. You know, like, oh, well, I could just go the west side and then I can just come back out the west side. No, he doesn't say that at all. He wanted them to understand something. When you come into the house of God, you're never supposed to leave the same way you came in. God does not want you to leave this place the same way you came in. But see, we all have intentions. You have intentions. Some of you guys had intentions to get to Golden Corral early or wherever, you, Cheesecake Factory. I just say Golden Corral because it's gross. <laughs> just trying to make you what? Golden Corral, dude. Is that a still open? Yes, it is. It is all you can eat. Now, let me, let me, let me just say something real quick. Have you, who's been to Golden Corral? Come on. I have a lot. A lot. You don't have to choose all the bad foods. They have grilled chicken and grilled fish there. You can eat it. And you know, I went with a friend one time, uh, me and this brother of mine, and we went out there, and we were, we were eating, and I sat down, and I started eating, and I looked over, and I saw people getting up and going back, and you know, not once did I get jealous. Not once did I go, God, they keep getting up and going. Why are they still going and getting food? What's wrong with them? I'm not getting as much food as they are. Why? Because I was getting full on my own. I'm not going to be upset at how many times somebody keeps going to the table. You don't need to be getting upset because God did this thing for this person or this thing for that person. You're in the same house, in the same place. You can go to the table as many times as you want to. It's up to you to get up and get going. You got to keep going, right? So, so there is, that's why the word says that where contentions and strife are is every evil work. That means envyings. That means comparison. That means you're opening the door wide for the enemy to come in in your life. But God said, I've come to do a new thing for you. Something new. Everybody say new. new. You're doing new things today. Today, your mindset is shifting today. Right? Yes. Things are changing today. Because today is literally the first day. Everybody say first day. First day. You know, in, in America, we think Monday's the first day. Because work, right? Oh, God, it's Monday. Right? But no, look at your calendar. Even the Gregorian calendar. Not a Christian calendar. It's not Christian. There's no scriptures on it. Unless they put them there. But the Gregorian calendar, it starts on what day? Sunday. I can't hear you. Sunday, Sunday is the first day. And so it, it, it struck a nerve in me. It just, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And I want you to look at something in Luke 24 that resonated with me. And I believe it's for us today. You guys hungry this morning? Yeah. I know you're hungry for Golden Corral. I'm just kidding. Maybe not. Now check this out. <clears throat> this is the resurrection day. My uh, subtitle for this chapter in the New King James says, He is risen. He's not still in the grave. Guess who's still in the grave? Buddha. 
Guess who's still in the grave? Muhammad. Uh, guess who's still in the grave? Any and every other person that prophesied to be the Savior or the Messiah or saying they had another way other than God's way. They're all still in the grave. But we've got one who's no longer in the grave. Amen? Now check this out. It says, now. Okay, we can just go home right now. Now. Awesome. Right now. Everybody, who wants to have a healing or restoration or blessing in your life right now? Yes. Well, no, I'll wait, I'll wait till tomorrow. Like, I'm pretty good right now. I've got, I've got enough. Who would want more time in the day right now? This guy? Or better time management? This guy? Right now. Right now. And so now on the what day, guys? First day. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they, no, it says right now, very early in the morning. <laughs> it's like, man, 9 a.m., we haven't done this before. It's been a while. So very early in the morning, that's you guys and girls and people, they came, certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing spices which they had prepared, but they found the stone rolled away. It was rolled away. And they're like, what just happened? It's not like, you know, you get a couple guys and you can like, push, push. No, it was, took four people to move this stone into the place to seal it. And not only did they seal it, they, they put a wax seal on it with the stamp stating that if the seal's broken, you're in trouble, like you will die. Not only that, they put two guards in front of this stone, in front of this tomb, and they said, if you leave, now they didn't have to say this, this was understood in the Roman army, if they left their post, they would die. And they roll up to this place, stone rolled away. They're like, what just happened? It, it, and so they're still thinking in despair. They're still thinking in uh, lack. They're still thinking in grief. And, and they weren't really thinking or remembering things that Jesus had told them. See, we were talking the other day that we feel like we're surrounded, right? You feel like you're surrounded by things, pressures, trials, tribulations, problems, situations, you know, like when you feel surrounded, you need to realize that he's surrounding you. God's surrounding you. Even though you feel like you're surrounded, God's surrounding you. And victory is already yours. Right? And, and so it says that now they get there and the stone was rolled away and they're thinking, oh, they're like, who just stole our Savior's, our, our Master, or our Teacher's dead body? Look at it. Very next verse. Verse 3. It says, they went and they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And they were greatly perplexed about this. And behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. So let me just stop that. They weren't in some bedazzled clothes. Okay? It said two angels, two mighty, huge people showed up, and it says that their raiment or their appearance was as glory. It was light, like boom, like light shining out of them. That alone would freak me out. Okay? Uh, even though I'm a pastor or whatever, I'd be like, whoa, oh, wow. You know, you'd be like, what is going on right now? So they, they see this, and they're afraid, and they bow their faces to the earth, and they say, the, the angels say to the two women, why do you seek the living among the dead? Why do you, in fact, put that up there, why do you seek the living among the dead? It's in verse 5, if you're taking notes. Because sometimes we have to be reminded of things. We've got to be reminded that, you know, God has us surrounded. Even though we feel like, you know, there's no hope for tomorrow, there's no future, there's no nothing, but he has us already surrounded. He already has a plan prepared for us. Right? And he goes on, they say, you know, hey, remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of the sinful men and be crucified on the third day, rise again? And they're like, oh, yeah. You ever been there before? Oh, yeah. Sorry, God, I just wasn't thinking. But I, I wanted to really focus in on what those two angels said to those two women. They said, why do you seek the living among the dead? 
So many times we're asking God to do a new thing in our life or asking him to help us in cert certain situations or areas, but we still look to him in dead things. We're still going to a tomb that's empty, asking him, Lord, if it's your will, will you please help me? Will you please heal me? And we think that we can manipulate God or we can control God into modifying him to fit what our need is in that moment. Hey, God, I know I'm totally jacked up and I, and, I, and I won't stop doing what I'm supposed to stop doing. But hey, will you fix this for me? That's modified. Modified doesn't work with God, right? Does not work at all. He wants you to be transformed. When I was praying, in fact, I wasn't even praying. Let me just be very clear. This morning, I woke up at about 5 a.m. and the Holy Spirit told me, change. And I'm like, to change my whole message? Like, Really? <laughs> I've only got like an hour. We got we to gotta hurry. And he's like, he, he's like, change. Change. And he just kept saying change to me. Oh, I just kept, it kept hearing. It wasn't like I heard change. <laughs> now, the alarms in our house started going off weird all of a sudden. I was like, okay, God, I get it. Alarm, alarm. Yes, I'll change my message. Okay. But he kept saying to me, change. And, he, and then he, he gave me this. He goes, I want this to be a day of change for everyone in this place. Just like in the, the law of worship, you may have come in. Now, we, you can go out the same door. You can go out the same door. I'll let you. We got a new covenant. And it'd be really hard to get you out our other exit door over there. But don't leave that exit the same way you came in. Today is a day of change for you. Now, remember... We all have intentions. We have intentions. You know, I want to get here early. I'm going to go eat. I got stuff I want to do today. It's freezing outside. Oh, my gosh. We have all these intentions. Some of you have intentions. You know, you came here with the intention of like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. It's Easter. I'm supposed to come on Easter. Or, or you had the intention of like, okay, it's going to be amazing. I'm going to get everything I can out of it. Or you have the intention like, you drug me here. I have to come here. And I'm planning on, my intention is when I leave here is to go and watch some basketball that I DVR'd last night or whatever. I don't know. There's all types of different intentions, but God has an intention for you that far exceeds any intention you could have for yourself. His intention for you is one of joy. It's one of peace. It's one of life. In fact, we know that, that you know, we were kind of said this the other day, the most popular scripture probably is John 3, 16, but the most second popular is Jeremiah 29, <laughs> Hello. So what is it? Uh, for I know the plans that I have for you, they're plans of hope and a future. God has a hope and a future for you today. Amen. So you may have come in with different intentions, but your intentions, how you come in, it puts you in a different position. So the intention that you have will position you for where you're going to continue on in your life. God's saying to you right now, get in my position. Get in my position. My position is one of ease. It's one of no trouble. It's one of, of no sorrow. It may, sorrow may last for night, but joy comes in the morning. It's getting in his position, right? You see, a lot of times the enemy comes in just like we read. The enemy, he crucified Jesus. He's like, I got him. I've got a plan. You know, God has a plan for your life. The enemy also has a plan for your life. And his plan is, is not to, to give you a hope in the future, but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Right? And so the enemy, he, one of the things that we heard from our founding pastor, uh, Karen Mosley, she said, the enemy always overplays his hand. He always does. Has anybody ever played cards, Uno, or something like that with someone? Uh, a younger child, maybe, and they're like, uh, "Hey, what, what, what?" And the, the, their hand just suddenly goes down, like they're they're talking, and then they're just showing you every card, and you're like, you're like looking away because like I don't want to beat my four year old daughter that badly. I know what she has, and I'm about to we're playing go fish. I'm about to like crush her right now, you know, <laughs> you know. But 
and that's how it is with the enemy. Like he thinks he has this master plan. Oh, I am going to crucify Jesus. I am going to bury him. He's defeated me in sickness. He's defeated me in disease. He's defeated me in bondage. He's defeated me in lack. He's defeated me in all these areas, but I've got one. I've got an uh, ace up my sleeve. I've got him. I'm going to kill him. It's going to be awesome. And then we're going to win then I'll keep my rule. I'll keep my reign. I'll keep my dominion. I'll keep that bondage. They may have got me for a little bit, but I am going to keep my territory. Because the kingdom of God, let me tell you what the kingdom of God is. The kingdom of God is not a place. It's a position. It's not a place. Yes, there is heaven. In, in the, but when, he, when they say the kingdom of God, when Jesus says, repent, he doesn't say, hey, you guys are horrible. You better stop doing that. He goes, repent. The kingdom of God is nigh at hand. What he's saying, repent, literally means to change the way you're thinking for the good. So repent, literally, when Jesus is saying this in Aramaic, however he said it, he, he's saying, hey, guys, your thinking has been limited. Your thinking has been bound I want you to change the way you think, and I want you to think for the good, because my way, this is the kingdom of God, kingdom of God translates to God's way of doing things, is now available. So King James kind of jacks it all up for us because, you know, we, we, we don't understand, oh, repent for the kingdom of heaven is nigh at hand. <laughs> hand, nigh, what does, I don't even know. Like, what does that mean? What it means is this, literally translated, Paul Cooper translation, 2018, changing the way you're thinking for the good because God's way of operating is now available to you. So now you can think like he thinks. Now you can do like he does. And you're like, well, that doesn't sound right because I was raised in this church and, and in this church label that I was raised in, they said, no eye has seen, no ear has heard what has entered into the heart of man. How can we understand God's thoughts? His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. Ha! Right? Ha! You got to throw that in there to sound spiritual. Ha! Right? But we stop there. We stop right at that. And we leave off those things. Have you ever talked to somebody and you hear like, hey, man, how you doing? Oh, man, really good. Yeah, things are going good. But, you know, and then they tell you how they really feel. So when you hear that word, but... Here's what's really about to happen. This is what they're really thinking. And so you got to turn your butt around sometimes, right? And, and so in turning your butt around, they leave it off in the scriptures for some reason. They read all this stuff about God, and then they, they leave off the but God. See, what they're, they're hearing is all the, the old stuff, the old way of thinking, the, the way that Jesus is telling them to repent from. He's like, hey, yeah, no eye has been able to see. No ear has able been able to hear. No one's ever been able to enter into God's heart of way of doing things. But I'm here to bring change. Jesus came to bring change. Everybody say change. See, he came to bring change. He goes, but God has revealed those things unto you. So now he's like, what? Like it was a radical way of thinking, a radical way of speaking, a radical way of seeing and doing things. So God came, Jesus came to bring radical change in yours and my life. Amen? So, you know, the devil, he was thinking, hey, I got this. I got this. You know, I'm, I'm on a roll. I've got him. You know, like we just like beat him really good. We mocked him. And, you know, he says, you know, he can never be mocked, but we just did. <laughs> right? Like, the, the, here's what happened if you don't know what happened um, as Jesus was going through all that he went through. They put a bag over his head and began to punch him, the guards relentlessly and say prophesy who just hit you like oh come on you you're the you're the son of god why don't you tell us they ripped his beard out that was a shamey thing they shamed him it says that they lashed him those 39 times he was fulfilling every prophecy ever given why 
So you and I would not have to be shamed. So you and I would not have to be struggled. So you and I would not have to hurt forever. So you and I would not be separated. So there would not be that gap any longer. Amen? So since he, he thought that he had it, it all taken out, he overplayed his hand because when Jesus died, he's like, oh, this is the end. It's over. We've won. And so what did he do? Jesus is in hell, and, and, and the enemy just starts bombarding him, just like throwing everything. He's like, get the kitchen sink, get the toilet, uh, go get your kids, get your wife, you know, get them all. Bring them. Let's just dogpile them. Do y'all know what dogpile is? Y'all are looking at me like, what is a dog pile? In the South, a dog pile is when, when you're running and you get tackled, then suddenly both teams just come and pile on top of you. Now, I, I will tell you this. The, the enemy, Satan, is the master of the pylon technique. Right? You got, who saw Karate Kid? Anybody? Karate Kid? You know, what's this? Whoa. Crane style, right? Whoopa! Kick. Daniel LaRusso. And defense, right? There's a certain style, a certain technique. Well, the enemy is the master of the pylon technique. He'll pile on struggle. He'll pile on financial burden. He'll pile on worry. He'll pile on marital problems. He'll pile on body problems. He'll pile all those things on. And that's what he was doing in hell, just piling everything on Jesus, thinking, we got him. It's over. We've won. But the battle had just begun. The battle just begun because Jesus was just waiting. He was waiting and waiting because he knew that his father was about to reach down with his arm and pull him up. But not just pull him up empty-handed. Pull him up with keys. Keys to the kingdom. Keys to death and hell, destruction, so you wouldn't have to have it. Amen? That's what we have available to us. That's the change. That's the shift that Jesus wants us to make. There's things changing. Amen? Say, so things are changing. You see, God is not average. I have not, I look, I've scoured the Bible. I cannot find an area in the Bible where God did something average. Like, and God got a C. No. God is super normal, supernatural. He's exceedingly great. Anytime you see a, a, a God defined in an area, you don't see common. There's never anything common. As a matter of fact, the first time that, that Jesus is, um, was uh, appearing, it said that the Son of Man appeared to someone. This, and whenever you hear the Son of Man or an angel of the Lord, it was Jesus appearing uh, to people. And he was appearing as light because they couldn't even define what he was. But when you look in the Bible and try to find the first time that God is named, man tries to name him, and it's Abram. Abram tries to name God, and he says, You are Jehovah Yireh. The Lord who sees ahead and provides. The Lord who makes present. He, he brings things to you. And that's a great one. But what if um, you need peace? What if you need healing? What if this? And so God comes to Moses in the wilderness. And he says, I'm going to lead your people, my people, out of slavery. Because I've heard their cries. And he goes, okay, that's awesome. Well, I just killed a, a guy 40 years ago, so uh, how are we going to do this? I don't, like, do I go and, like, practice my technique again? He's like, no, I'm sending you. And when I send you, you're going to go with my name. And he's like, well, who do I say sent me? Who do I say? Do I say, you know, because Pharaoh, he, he was considered, he considered himself as a god. See, there's so many gods that we have in our lives. There's gods that we think, you know, oh, I've got this God of finances, or I've got this God of struggle, or, or I've got this God called Facebook or Instagram. <laughs> and what that means by God is like you're spending more time worshiping that than you are the one who created you. That's what it means. Like, oh, I don't worship no Facebook. Okay, give me your phone and let me check out your battery life and see where the majority of the juice is going. Okay. Oh, what? Oh, Instagram, what? 70%? 
In the old King James, they would call that a God. But see, he says, when I, when, when I want you to present yourself to my people and to your enemy, I will not be defined by a narrow margin. I will not be defined by an adjective. I will not be defined by something as, as low as magnificent, <laughs> excellent, mighty. He's not going to be defined in any of those things. He's going to be defined by a verb because he is what he is and all that is required of necessity for your life. That's what he is. And so he goes, tell them the I am of the I am sent you. What does that mean? Well, that means that he is. Well, I've got sickness in my, my body. Well, he is healing. Well, I've got family troubles. Well, he is the restorer and the repairer of the breaches. Well, I've got insecurity issues or I've got um, uh, uh, st 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 stutter problems. Well, he is the Lord, your healer. He is the Lord, your confidence. He is the Lord, your victory. He waves his banner of victory over you. Whatever you need him to be, he is. And why am I telling you all this Old Testament stuff? This wasn't have to do with Resurrection Sunday. Everything. Everything. Because he came to bring change. He is, not was, he is a barrier breaker. Jesus is the barrier breaker. He's breaking through barriers right now in your heart and mind. Whether it be offense, whether it be boredom, you better not be bored up in this place. Something's wrong with you. We got coffee. What's wrong with you? So <laughs> he broke through every religious tradition, every label. Don't allow labels to define you. Well, I'm just this, and I'm just that, and oh, I'm, and then like oh, and like you know, people talk about color skin. You know what? Let me just crush something right now. Jesus was dark. Okay, guess what? Adam and Eve were dark. So, unfortunately, that, why do you think us white people tan all the time? Because we want to be more like God. Come on. Glowing. What do you say when you're tanning? When you get tan, white people, come on. I mean, Caucasian people, sorry, I wasn't PC on that. What? Why do you think that we go to the tanning and all that stuff? Well, that'll cause cancer. But we get a glow about you. Oh, you look so glowy. That's the glory. That's the glory. That's glory, right? Anyhow, <laughs> side note. Let me get back. Let me get back. Let me get back. Mm -mm -mm. God came to break barriers. Don't allow a label to define you. A label will limit you and keep you in a place of prison. People ask me all the time, I, in the first three years that we started this, uh, or took this over actually, um, they'd come into me and they go, hey, hey, what kind of church are you? And I'm like, oh God, here we go. Because that's such, such a loaded question. It's so loaded. So loaded. And I'm like, we are a Bible-believing church. <laughs> but we don't handle snakes. You know, because they're like, oh, you're one of those. I even had to, uh, I, I told one person, like, we're kind of Bapticostal. I said that one time. What does that mean? Well, we believe in salvation. We believe in reaching the lost. We believe in the way they believe. But then we also got the Holy Ghost <laughs> in fire. Like, we are not a denomination because we will not, a label, not allow a label to limit or define us by a narrow margin. Isn't that what God said? Jesus said to the people that were questioning him, they says, are you the king? And he goes, I am, remember the I am, I am the resurrection and the life. So if you need some things resurrected in your life, he is, he is. It's no longer, you know, this was a radical shift when Jesus, the, the, the Passover, we're celebrating actually Passover right now. Did you know that? In Jewish culture, Passover already started. So we're actually celebrating it right now. What were they celebrating? Being delivered from slavery and being brought out into a place of more than enough. They weren't lacking. They weren't missing anything. They weren't broken. It says that they all went, nothing missing, nothing lacking, nothing broken. Amen? It's pretty awesome. 
So, with that being said, we have a position. Remember, intention, position. We have a position, and it says that we're seated at his right hand now. The I am, the resurrection, and the life. You now have a position of authority in your life. You now have a position to where it doesn't matter what the devil comes at you with. It doesn't matter when he comes in to try to steal, kill, or destroy. That's what he wants to do. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy in every area of your life and in any way he can. Sometimes he won't make it so blatant and obvious. He'll allow little things in. But Jesus came, remember the burial record, he came to say, I've come to give you life. That's sozo. That means nothing missing, nothing lacking, and give it to you more abundantly. Right? In fact, let's look at it. John 10. John 10. <clears throat> so Jesus' intention is for you to have and enjoy life, right? Now it says here in the Amplified... It says, the enemy, the thief, comes in only, only in order to steal, to kill, and destroy. But I came that they may have life and enjoy life, not just have life. Like, see, a lot of times what we'll do is we'll allow the enemy to come in and to lie to us. Allow, we'll have this old thinking mindset. Well, I'm just, I just need to get by. I just, I just need to get by. That's not life. So, so here's what he said. He goes, I want you to be very clear. I want to be very clear to this. And he goes, I want you to not only have life, but enjoy life. It's not meant to be suffered or endured. It's meant to be enjoyed. That's why we have that in here in this church. We want to enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. You know what overflow means. You remember, I, I made a big old mess up in this place one night. We kept full, filling it up and filling up till it overflowed. And it's just like a, a buffet. You can keep going to the table until you're so full that it's overflowing. Right? Like, I ate too much. I can't breathe. He wants you to have that kind of life. Amen? And he goes on to say this. He goes, well, that's great, but what's in it? You know, how do I know that you really want this for me? How do I know that you really are going to bring this? Who in here has ever been promised something and then they fell through on the promise? Oh, all of us. In fact, some of us are, you know, still getting over some things. I'm not going to be. I'm just kidding. We've all been told something. Hey, man, I had someone, uh, in fact, our founding pastor, when she went out to, to preach on the road, um, she was serving for years, years, years at this amazing church in Nashville. And the pastor said, yeah, it's time for you to get out and go and serve. And so she started ministering. And people, she told me the story, people would come up to her and say, hey, uh, man, I'm so excited for you. We want to support you and your ministry. And they're like giving big fat numbers, like four digit numbers. Boom, boom. Every month, boom. But she's like, whoa, I should have done this a long time ago. Right? She said, not one of them ever came through. Not one of them. So you can't allow the promises of someone else be your faith. Be your God. Remember, we're talking about God's. What, you know, don't, don't, you know, no, no, no. You got to go to what he says. And so, so Jesus, he goes, hey, I'm not going to fail you. I'm not going to let you down. He says, I've come to give you life to the full, till it overflows more abundantly. And the very next verse, here's what he says. I love this. Verse 11. He says, I am the good shepherd. That, that one statement is so loaded. It is so loaded because a shepherd... They take care of their flock. They're checking their flock. They're, they're getting the, the unruly ones out, separating them, getting them right, cleaning out those ones, and then bringing them all back in together, nurturing them up, leading them, not driving them. And he says, I am the good shepherd. Once again, the I am. If you need some shepherding in your life, if you need um, some comfort in your life, if you didn't have a very good upbringing or a relational situation with your family, he can be that good shepherd. He can be that father to the fatherless. He can be that husband to the widow. He can be whatever it is you need. But here's how, he, here's how he seals the deal. The good shepherd risks and lays down his own life for the sheep. 
He put it all on the line for you and for me. He's like, hey, I'm going to stand behind my word, and I'm going to lay down my life. Jesus didn't get killed. He wasn't crucified on the cross. He laid down his life so you and I could pick it back up. Amen? Say, I'm picking it back up. Now, in this John 10.10, 10, Jesus was crushing every possible religious tradition. He was upsetting all the Pharisees, all the Sadducees to no end. They're like, who is this guy? He, he, he casts out devils by devils. He heals with magic. He does all kinds of, they were super upset. But he's like, no, no. I've come to give you life. I've come to open your eyes. This is what he said the very first time he preached. Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. He's anointed you. Now why? What for what purpose? To bring good news to the poor, recovery of sight to the blind, heal the brokenhearted, release the captives that are imprisoned. That's what he did for you and for me. And so then we can do that same thing for everyone else. Amen? He's doing a new thing, right? Everybody say new thing. Isaiah 43, that is kind of that that is our scripture for this year. He gave it to us in the earlier part of the year. This is our scripture. He is doing a new thing. Isaiah 43, 19. It says, hey, behold, in the King James and New King James, that word behold, it means this. Pay attention. Take notice. I see something that you don't see. I'm about to do something new. What does that mean? Change change. He wants to bring radical change. Remember that word repent. It means turn in your thinking for the good. It literally is a picture of 180, going the opposite direction. That means change. And so he says, I am about to do a new thing. And it says in the, uh, let me break it down in the new living. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. See, I've already begun. God's already done it in your life. Before the foundations of the world were formed, he created and planned you. You. Was it your mommy and your daddy? It wasn't some sparkle in somebody's eye. He had a plan for you before the foundations of the world. Right? And he says, I've already done it. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. Now, what is it, why is he telling this? Why is he saying, hey, I'm about to do something new? Because we have been holding on to old mindsets. We've been holding on to old tradition. Even if you're some Holy Ghost Pentecostal person, you've probably, if I sat down and talked with you for a while, you probably are still listening old things. Well, do you remember the times when William Seymour put a bucket on his head and then, and I just went, I've been putting a bucket on my head for five years and nothing's happened. Well, you're thinking old and you're weird. So, <laughs> yeah, don't try to do what God told someone else to do. Let me be very clear. Don't try to, to define God by a narrow margin. Well, if he did it that way, that's great. And we can learn from that. That we can learn the reverence. We can learn the honor. We can learn the respect. Because what the what our founding pastor plowed through seventeen layers of cement and granite for this to be right now, we're standing upon that. But we're not trying to do what she did, how she did. We're listening to God to tell us what to do, right? And so he's saying, forget about what's happened. Don't keep going over old history. Don't throw it out, but don't keep going over that old stuff. Like, oh, well, that hurt my feelings. Get over it. Get over it. I'm telling you, by the Holy Spirit, get over it. Okay? I'm prophesying to you right now. Get over it. What'd you learn at Easter? Get over it. 
Yes, because the resurrection and the life cannot come to you if you're holding on to old junk, if you're holding on to old offense, if you're holding on uh, to, to old disease, old feelings, old mindsets. It, that, that's literally what he calls sin. He's saying, let go of that because I can't come and help you because I can't be where sin is. Worry is sin. Worry is sin. Oh, I don't what, How are we going to make, what, what, I don't know, what are we going to do? That's sin. He can't come help you when you're in sin. Now you're like, oh, God, and Holy Spirit does not condemn. I'm not the Holy Spirit, first of all. <laughs> secondly, <laughs> secondly, I'm not condemning you at all. I'm saying make a change. Jesus never condemned. He gave them a choice. Here's your choice. You can stay the way you are, or you can have change. You can have new life. In fact, many times you see him, he's like, hey, you know, blind Bartimaeus, son of God, have mercy on me. And remember we talked about the haters. <laughs> They're like, hey, shut up. Shut up. He's talking. The master's talking. Shh. I can't hear. Shh. He got all the louder, right? Because he heard Jesus was nearby. He wasn't going to miss his moment. And he's like, son of God, he got all the louder. Sometimes you've got, I'm not saying you've got to shout it, but you should shout in here. This is a safe place to shout. This, you will not get in trouble for shouting in this place. But he began shouting because he was not going to miss his moment. And then when Jesus said, bring him to me, suddenly his haters became his best friend. Like, oh, you're oh, highly favored. Look at Sir Dave. Isn't he a blessing? Uh, they were the ones that were saying, shut your mouth. Right? So don't, don't allow people's opinions of you, people's uh, pressure, keep you from receiving your miracle. Keep you from receiving your resurrection power. And when he came up to him, he says, hey, what do you want me to do for you? And we think, well, you're God. You should know. Right? Right? You know God. You know what I'm supposed to do. Just do it. No, he wants you to become humble honest open transparent because he can't fix what you hide god cannot fix what you hide he cannot heal what you're hiding he cannot restore that broken thing that you've kept back because you don't want anybody to know he wants you to come to him and he wants you to say hey i'm giving it to you I want you to bring resurrection life in this area. And that's what he's here to do today and every day. The tomb is empty. He's not there. So let's stop seeking the living among the dead. Amen.